Hey, everybody. Um, so it's really exciting to be here. Uh, so we have Bill Byrne from Google, uh, Lily uh, Clifford from Rhyme, and Corey Miller from Rev. And uh, what we're going to do is I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to first kind of set up the topic. Uh, all of us have linguistics backgrounds, uh, but uh, we, you know, the, the topic of naturalness is really hard. <laughs> like, what does naturalness mean, sort of? And, and so uh, we thought it would be a good idea to kind of give a sense of what natural might mean in this context. It, it, it changes depending on what you're talking about. Um, it has a lot of context to it. So uh, I, I'm going to kind of get into a little bit of linguistics to kind of say, well, here's some things that it might be about. And this is all kind of from my perspective. Uh, and then uh, after that, I'll talk a little bit about design. Uh, but what, what we're really going to do is just jump into uh, the discussion. And I've asked uh, Bill and and Lily and Corey to introduce themselves uh, because also they might want to just start taking a position or something like that or I just want to dive into that so I'm not going to go into the introductions themselves uh, yeah so that's about it uh, I am going to share a presentation all right you should be there it's just jumping around a lot Okay, like I said, my computer's sluggish. Uh, people have the ability to talk, that's where I was. So uh, what I wanna do is just play a short snippet of a uh, conversation that uh, is from a call friend corpus. It just, it's just out of the blue. You're just kind of just dropping into the middle of this conversation. It's okay if you can't hear it greatly. Just, you know, it's like you're walking down the street and hearing some people talk or something. And they still have just one daughter? Yes, and I think that's probably all. Cause um, I think Carl feels like people like me overpopulate the world. <laughs> <laughs> I have three sons now. Really? Yeah. God. And all boys? Yes. No girls. Oh my God. <laughs> all right. So, hope you heard it. Uh, yes. If not, it's okay. <laughs> so that's just, you just dropped in the middle of that. So if we if we think about it, you just heard that you probably didn't get much of it. It just kind of went by. And, and that's talk. And, and that's what we do. And what's really cool about talk is that we learn to do that very proficiently by around the age of kindergarten. So talking is something that is kind of, it's, it's natural for humans in the sense that uh, it's, it's something, it's a skill that we get very early. Uh, and would, many would say it's innate, it's right, all those kinds of things. So then naturalness. Uh, so naturalness in this context, then, uh, in the context of people talking, which we can do, uh, then let's just kind of talk about naturalness for, uh, naturalness for a moment. What does, what does that mean? What could it mean? Well, one of the things would be the sounds, right? So we heard a bunch of sounds in that conversation. Uh, and so sounds uh, are interesting because they're not at all like what writing is. They'd be completely different. So this is kind of an example I learned from a teacher in grad school. So I'm just gonna say something and I want you to just kind of guess what it is, but don't say it out loud. I'm just, just, just a thought experiment. You're gonna say it and you're gonna guess what it is. G? So maybe you didn't get that. So then I could add maybe something else to it and say, G yet? Maybe you still didn't get it. And so then maybe it might be, a, Hey, Corey, yeet yet? So hopefully you've been able to capture what it is. I've tested you this out that. even with, uh, <laughs> yeah, with speech systems. So uh, it's interesting uh, how, how they capture this. So it's, is this jeet is the original thing I said, which in writing would be this way. So, so the sounds when we talk are just completely different from what the writing looks like or, or would make you think that it sounds like. And that's not like, that's just normal. Like that is just absolutely normal how we talk. So that's uh, one aspect of uh, naturalness that we can think of. Another is prosody. So prosody can mean a lot of different things, depends on, uh, but, but I'm, not, I'm not here as a linguist, I'm here as a designer. So I'm gonna talk about how I think of prosody as a designer. Uh, so prosody uh, in spontaneous talk, if you go back to the conversation that we were listening to that went by so quickly, uh, there's just all this like stuff that's happening. So they pause, they, ha they have changes in pitch or voice quality. So those are going to be things like, oh my gosh, and things like that, creepy voice, things like that, lengthening, gosh, and oh, and maybe the speed. I have three boys now, you know, suddenly she's talking like this and then 
it's kind of a more regular speed. So it could be changes in speed, intensity, loudness, all kinds of things can be considered, uh, in my view, prosody. And so then um, what comes out of prosody then for me is I, I, I use this, uh, uh, I tend to look at things uh, from, uh, from this book by Wallace Chase, uh, it's Discourse, Consciousness and Time. And um, he talks a lot about intonation units and I really like how this helps me uh, think about how language is structured as spontaneous language, especially. So let's get talk real quickly about this. There's intonation units, there's three types. So there's like the fragmentary ones when that conversation, the woman just says, and, and then the other woman interrupts her, but that end is called fragmentary. Then you got regulatory ones, which are things like discourse markers and fillers, like, oh, and gosh, those kinds of things. And then substantive ones, which are the ones that have content. So I have three sons now, that's a content one. And there's just kind of some fun things or facts that we get uh, from this approach is this notion that an intonation unit that has content, for example, has a mean word, this is for English, a mean of 4.84 words per intonation unit. So on average, they last one to two seconds. So it's just kind of interesting to think about a speech stream and how much information is being carried in the number of words or in an, in an amount of time and what, how much can, can people process. The other thing about speech is that it's, it's ephemeral or effervescent, people like to say. So you, you can't remember what it was when you hear it. It's just gone, it comes and goes. So these things have um, impact in terms of memory and what, what people uh, can remember when they're interacting with the system or when they wanna talk to a system. So this affects both sides. Another way of looking at all of this is identity. So uh, just keeping track. So identity itself, uh, we could say that uh, each of us has our own personal language. Uh, linguists call those idiolects. Uh, philosophically, you know, a lot of people think, well, we just really language is something that is just individual to a person. And then uh, they may not have one language, they might have many languages or dialects. And then we all use different styles depending on the context that we're in. The style that I use in home is different from the style that I'm using here on Zoom in a meeting. It would be different if we were in an auditorium and I was talking to you. Style changes, and style could include all the things, sounds, words, syntax, it, it just includes all kinds of things. Uh, and then we have shared languages. Uh, so then shared languages, maybe those are the things that we create together and uh, those emerge out of talking and other types of interactions and they happen in all these different places and they have time components and place components and who's their components. And those are all the ways that we use language in a shared way. And I bring this up because it contrasts with, uh, you could think of shared language as like, oh, there's you know the dictionary, like things that make it seem like a language is something that's shared officially. But uh, like linguists, uh, not all linguists, but some linguists talk about a thing called standard language ideology. And these, it's the idea that a standard language or even a, you know, the notion of a neutral language or anything like that is, uh, it's an ideology. It doesn't really exist. Nobody really speaks a standard language. Nobody really actually uses it. Uh, and, and, and it's associated with maybe some problems in terms of bias or things like that. So it's an interesting thing to think about when it comes to naturalness with systems. And there's just a whole bunch of other things we've talked about. Words, syntax, pragmatics, meaning, multimodality, variation, sociocultural factors, I mean, and things I'm not even mentioning here. So there's a lot of stuff that would make up naturalness and what we would mean by that may vary um, depending on the context. In terms of myself as a designer, human needs, um, I really think it's important that we let people be themselves when they're talking to systems. So I think that, um, you know, more like a North Star type of thing, less like I know it can't happen in practice all the time. There's always constraints and things like that. But each person has a right to use their own personal language and they will anyway. Uh, so we should try to, you know, let them be themselves. They shouldn't face bias or discrimination or barriers when using systems and in life generally. So um, that's kind of a principle that I go by. And then the design practices, some things is just, go outside for data discovery and design, meaning don't use yourself, your, your colleagues, your company. It's not really gonna represent the full diversity that's out there. So I recommend getting out, recording, talking, listening, transcribing, analyzing, because speech goes so fast. If you think that you caught what was said, you probably didn't. Uh, context really matters. Context can be anything. It could literally be, uh, 
anything physical, you know, anything in the environment. It could be things going on in a person's mind. It could involve how you're interacting with the machines, like on the watch. Uh, you know, it's a, a certain form factor. So context includes a lot of things. And uh, conceptual models, really good to set those in place. Um, and then um, definitely you want to uh, design and evaluate in the same context or similar context to where the interaction will take place because language varies and what we think about language varies depending on context so much. So I recommend using um, techniques such as informances, participatory, participatory design and body storming uh, to, to replicate the context. And it kind of raises some questions about what we do with, when we're evaluating uh, systems. So that's about it. Uh, uh, I hope that helps set up the talk. Uh, the panelists uh, will introduce themselves. I just want to say that, um, for example, uh, Bill, I've known Bill for a very long time. Uh, I, I think uh, probably a good 20 years. Uh, he was kind enough to let me uh, visit his class uh, that he was teaching at Stanford on voice user interface design. Uh, I always admired the work that he's uh, done over the years. And so I'm really grateful he's here. He definitely does a lot of uh, natural, uh, what I consider to be, has, he has a natural approach. Uh, Corey, I've worked with, uh, he uh, has a great sensibility of meeting people's needs. Uh, one of the systems he and I uh, worked on together it was one of the best performing systems I've, I've ever had. I was uh, amazed by it. So um, I just know Corey as a colleague and respect the work that he's been doing since we stopped working together a long time ago. And then uh, Lily, I uh, have just been a real admirer of Lily and Rhyme Labs and the voices that they've created and the mission that I understand they're on. Uh, I think it's, they bring a lot of naturalness and a lot of inclusion into the space. And um, I've heard Lily speak at a number of uh, meetups, and I'm just really excited to have these three. So that's where I'm going to uh, stop. And I'm going to first uh, just uh, let uh, Bill introduce uh, himself. Uh, and I told them they could each kind of go mm, three to five minutes if they wanted to. I don't know how long they're going to go or anything, but we'll start with Bill. Thanks. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Uh, everybody disappeared. Oh, they are. So uh, thank you, Mary. Thanks for inviting me. It's really excited to be here. I don't want to talk too much up front. I really wish that I was in a room with all of you so we could kind of hear what you want to talk about. <laughs> and, um, you know, this topic, uh, and I know Mary is uh, doing her best here, but it is, she did choose quite a broad topic quite a very broad topic to talk about. So we could talk about everything from TTS voices to, you know, you know, large language models and what that means for the future of uh, you know, punishing prescriptivists throughout the globe, et cetera. But I'll just say that I've been, um, I've been at Google for the last 18 years. Before that, I was at SAP doing enterprise uh, stuff for voice application systems. Uh, before that, I was at General Magic, which is kind of a famous company now in, in this uh, day and age. And um, I got my start as a as a linguist. Uh, I got my PhD in linguistics from UC San Diego, and I just thought I'd be a, an academic, but that turned out to be quite boring for me. And uh, once I got involved in computational linguistics, uh, things became much more interesting. Um, so in the in the in the past five years, I have been working with large language models. Which, if you if you've worked at all with dialogue systems, um, you'll appreciate just how they've finally changed the struggles that we've faced <laughs> for 30, 40 years in this industry. Right, where you had to use these kind of deterministic systems, finite state machines to to try to deal with human language, which is just basically impossible. That's why Siri or the Assistant or Amazon Echo, they, they just don't work, right? Because it just doesn't work. So it's really exciting for me now uh, because I've been working uh, originally, you know, Google was had Lambda. And so that was a, an exciting time to work early, with early large language models. And I built a, uh, with my team, we built a big data gathering system because with models now you, you can gather data and uh, you know, do just wondrous things that one could never do before. Uh, and the model learns quite quickly how to behave in all the 
quote unquote right ways that that Mary was alluding to, right? You can get rid of some of these these troublesome uh, hiccups that you find when you're trying to program uh, a system to do what it's supposed to do. Um, so I actually am pretty positive on the future of of uh, language interaction with computers, whether it be spoken, written, chat, or multimodal. And um, and that's all thanks to the technology that is literally evolving every single day. There's a new article, there's a new discovery, there's a new uh, GitHub post or a or a, a third party that's you know done something new. Um, so my my focus now is um, using large language models to solve some of these uh, language interaction problems, uh, and to kind of finally just rid ourselves of. The struggles of the past with dialogue systems. Um, so that's my very positive way of looking at this. Uh, but I, like I said, I think maybe if I don't know, Mary, if it's possible, if people if people want to, or if the other my other panelists want to kind of suggest topics that are more kind of top of mind to most people, I'd rather kind of wait and see uh, before I kind of take take things in one direction or the other. Um, so I'll I'll, I'll defer. Mm -hmm. To Lily or Corey, and then we'll go from there. But I'm also happy just to not talk at all and just listen to them because I'm sure they're, I'm sure they're smart and riveting in their own right. That's Thank enough you, for Bill. Me. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, and then um, I, I was hoping Lily could uh, talk next. Hi, can you all hear me? Awesome. Yes. So yeah, I, I would say I also got my start. <laughs> My very recent start as a linguist, um, starting in 2018, I was a PhD student at Stanford. Uh, I actually didn't start as a computational linguist. I was doing uh, vowel acoustics type stuff. Um, I'm actually going to hide myself view because I was just spotlighted. I can't. It's like I'm looking in the mirror. So let me do that quickly. quickly. Can I do that? I don't know. I made you spotlight because I wanted people to know who was talking. It's okay. Um, <laughs> But in any case, yeah, I, I started, uh, I was working on gender-based differences in vowel acoustics um, as kind of like, how is it that that there are these pretty um, biologically grounded differences in how we produce vowels that have to do with, for just, just one example, like the length of our vocal tracts, but that these seem to be modulated by behavior to an extent that's that's actually hard to comprehend, I think, for a lot of us. Um, and And... I, I, I kind of drifted into doing deep learning research as 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 one does being in the Silicon Valley and thinking through like big problems. I was really um, attracted to deep learning for asking kinds of questions about how computers understand sociolinguistic variation. So was working on, for example, like algorithmic bias in biometrics problems, uh, biometrics problems like speaker verification, like given one uh, Three second sample of someone's speech. Can you can a, can a deep learning system tell whether it was um, the same person's voice contained in this other three second segment of speech? The answer is like very much so, but but not reliably and not reliable, even less reliably for certain kinds of people. Um, certain ways of speaking um, was also working on um, gender classification. Kind of a from an emotional quotient perspective, a very strange problem. Uh, I, I it was the research I was doing was definitely not like how do we make gender speech gender classification better. It was more like what can we learn about sociolinguistic variation by 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 looking at the ways in which these systems perform really poorly. Um, and 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 for what it's worth, they they don't perform very poorly. Like you can train, for example, uh, a speech uh, gender classifier to train. Uh, to to classify on again like a three second segment of someone's speech their their voice gender it sounds icky and it is but uh, very reliably something like over ninety nine percent accuracy however when you unleash on real world data and I was dealing with real world data conversation data the Stanford has um, this corpus this really really beautiful amazing corpus called the Voices of California corpus which is over the last 10 years, almost every summer, um, Stanford grad students have gone to different parts of California and recorded what are called sociolinguistic interviews. It's really just, you go to uh, Sacramento, you go to Redlands, you go to Salinas, and then you just talk with a bunch of people and record them, um, people who grew up in that area. And when you 
have this, you know, gender classifier, which is 99% accurate, and you have it generate predictions for real world conversational data, you find that it a does a lot worse than the narration audiobook data that it was trained on, but it also does worse at, for example, uh, speakers of African American English than it did on the the white uh, conversational speech in the Voices of California corpus. Um, so those are the kind of questions I was working on, and I kind of got tired of being like, why are these systems bad? And I wanted to work on something that was um, more creative and and uh, really was was driven towards text to speech research that was being done. A lot of it was being done at Google um, at that point, 2018, 2019. And um, yeah, just got really interested in the in the in in how to bring linguistic diversity to the generative side of speech. And, and the way I put it often is like text to speech is the original generative AI. People have been doing text to speech for decades. Um, it's kind of funny that it's only now that we have say text to image generators when we've had text to speech um, systems for quite a long time. However, like and this is comes comes really back to the kind of the voice user interface kind of experience. Um, at the time that I started the company with my two friends. Um, if you were building, say you were building a, a reservation system for taking um, phone reservations and, and, and you were building this system for Texas Roadhouse, say, um, you were uh, gonna be pretty sorely disappointed in the offerings that there were from uh, existing vendors of, of Texas speech uh, products because you weren't gonna be able to get an on-brand voice. And it, this is how people think about this. It's like, how can we get an on-brand voice? Well, at that time, there weren't really any uh, Southern accented voices accessible by API um, for, for conversational AI applications for the enterprise, essentially. And so that's what we've been pretty narrowly focused on uh, at Rhyme. And I think of, you know, my background as a linguist really informs this. Um, we're talking with developers of these systems all the time and developers of an interactive voice response system are really kind of like designers par excellence because what they're dealing with is limitations um, and they're they're trying to navigate these limitations really um, in the best way that they can. And so that's what we're doing is building design tools for, for IVR and enter enterprise conversational AI applications that are really focused on how the voice sounds um, and, and, and whose voice, what kind of voice is being synthesized for, for the interactants in these systems, which are of course humans <laughs> at the end of the day. Um, so yeah, that, that's just a little bit about kind of what I've been working on over the last five years. Thank you, Lily. That was really good. Uh, and Corey, Love to hear from you. Sure. Hello. Well, thanks, Mary, for inviting me, and I'm delighted to see so many uh, former colleagues in the audience uh, from Nuance and also uh, Jarrett, uh, who worked with me at Rev. Uh, I'm also a linguist, originally a sociolinguist like Lily. Uh, my the way I got into linguistics was an interest in foreign languages and linguistics was just a way I could get credit for taking French, Spanish and German and stuff. And uh, I did sociolinguistics in Philadelphia at Penn and we would do field work not in sunny California, but on the streets of Philadelphia. Um, so I've always been interested in pronunciation primarily and some fast speech rules like connected speech processes like Mary demonstrated. Um, I worked in both TTS and ASR. I have to say TTS is definitely a little bit more interesting for a linguist, but most of the time ASR has paid more bills than TTS. But I'm hoping that uh, the generative audio will, will really change that equation a little bit. Um, what else could I tell you? I think I'll, I'll leave it at that um, just to, so you can get into the main part of the program. I have I have a um, a comment on uh, Lily's and Corey's thing, if you don't mind. Um, so I think this this idea of the the TTS side of this, as I actually anticipated, is is really interesting because it's one of the things that's still um, kind of annoying <laughs> when you hear a bad TTS voice today. You're just like, really? And it's not that it's bad in its uh, quality or its uh, or even its finish, right? It's let, let me just give you an, an anecdote that I that I found just to really kind of sums it up for me, which is um, I remember when I don't know when the Google Assistant came out, and you know you have to give people a break. A lot of people who work on speech and ASR at a big company 
haven't ever worked on it, right? So they're excited about it. And every three or four years, a new crop of people come in. And so they go through the same exact cycles that you've seen over and over and over again until recently, which I believe it's going to change now because the technology is slightly different. But when it came to TTS, right, as most of you know, you have, you have, Actors go to the studio and you give them the scripts and the script guy gives them all the ones and they're like, oh, well, they have certain joins and we're going to do this and that. And, you know, there was invariably there's always this interest from Hollywood or from the music industry where there's some personality like John Legend. Right. And we had John Legend come in and um, I'm like, well, this is this is going to be a disaster. Right. Um, and, and of course it was because in the end, Holly, which was the, you know, middle I don't know, 35 year old um, kind of Caucasian woman voice <laughs> that you heard for the last 40 years. Uh, that's how John Legend ended up sounding. Right? And it was really funny because when they recorded like long, uh, uh, lo like what, what's the term, Lily, the long range or the long, um, the long takes like happy birthday, right? You see, you hear, you can say, hey, sing happy birthday to me and you can choose his voice. And he sounds just like John Legend, right? But every, every other time he sounds like Holly. <laughs> like, what is going on, right? It's like, finally you have this opportunity to, to make a voice out of an, um, uh, at least an underrepresented kind of, you know, person uh, in the TTS world. And yet still it just came out to be this very safe sounding um, corporate, somewhat corporate sounding thing. And, uh, and I think, and again, I'm going to try to go on my positive. If you know me personally, you'll know that typically I'm kind of grumpy and not that positive, but uh, I am starting to see signs of, of huge change in people's minds, right? Like people are like, like I, like my former boss, I switched groups about a year and a half ago. We were actually talking about, you know, why don't we have one voice that is like, you know, this person, and you might say like some colleague of yours who, you know, is, his parents are from Shanghai and he came here when he was eight and he sounds just like the person from Shanghai comes through with eight. And there's another person who might, and it's not necessarily a foreign accent. It's just this diversity of voices that we don't even think about in real life, but they're never represented in, in technology. And it's today, it's really easy to do that, uh, right? It's much, well, I shouldn't say it's really easy to do. TTS is still hard. But to be able to represent um, a diversity of different humans in the choices of TTS is happening, like right before our very eyes, maybe still more slowly than we'd like it, but it's pretty, pretty fun, right? I mean, even the, even um, what you hear with Spotify and they, they have their, their AI, right? Their AI voice. And it's like, it's like slightly refreshing, right? Um, it might be predictable, but it's it's slightly refreshing and things like that never would have happened even five, six years ago. So I have to say that as far as trying to represent in a sociolinguistic type of way, lots of uh, a diversity of voices, I think we're starting to see that now. I'd be interested if, if Corey and Lily believe that and if they see it as uh, a good thing, if it's, if it's, it's, if it's going to exploit it and Obviously, everything could be exploited and, and turned into something negative, but at least people are thinking about it. And it, it, it's like, you know, the standard English speech of the professor or the newscaster is finally maybe being questioned, which is kind of nice. Corey, do you have uh, any thoughts? Well, uh, I was reminded of Henry Higgins, you know, that thing where he placed a guy, my fair lady, you know, Cheltenham Harrow. India, Cambridge, whatever, that we're all an amalgam of so many different language varieties. And it's a lot different from the way it was, you know, hundreds of years ago where people all stayed in the same town, supposedly, and we could make, you know, fancy dialect maps. So when I have students today who are saying, you know, I want to compare American dialects, I really don't believe it's as interesting as it used to be that you could really pin someone to a place uh, in the same way. Um, and so, yeah, maybe maybe Lily knows more about how, how you could make such amalgam synthetically, uh, but that was just what came to mind. Yeah, I mean, I think the, the, the one thing I want to say is like, from a design perspective, TTS has come very far um in in one sense the, that sense is like um yeah what one i was thinking about this panel over the last couple of weeks and 
um, was really coming back to the idea of how TTS systems are evaluated, both from a research perspective and also from um, kind of a usability perspective historically, which is this, this, this rating called the Mean Opinion Score or MOS. Um, the MOS is really like what you see, if you read a TTS paper that was published last week, you'll see them reporting mean opinion scores um, uh, for, for their results. And it's kind of funny that at the state of the art, what it relies on, the mean opinion score is you present audio that's generated by the system to, uh, at this point, usually un unwitting participants uh, and, and say from one to five, how natural does this sound? Um, that's often the prompt. There are different ways of structuring this kind of experimental stimuli, um, but that's, I think, the main one. And it's funny to me because the status quo for TTS is that it sounds very natural. In fact, it sounds indistinguishable from the training data. Um, and it's always kind of funny when we're talking with IVR developers, though, and they're like, yeah, but the voice sounds off, you know? And you're like, well, why does it sound off? Like, it sounds, I don't know. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like hard to put words to it because the voice is kind of perfect, actually. Like the, the voices from cloud vendors are perfect. Um, and and they're almost probably too perfect. Um, kind of, maybe that's kind of what you're alluding to, uh, Bill. It's like the, this, this veneer of the 20th century American broadcast standard, basically. Um, and... Uh, and 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 really like how you deal with that is is, is from our perspective by collecting uh, a lot of naturalistic data. The first eight months of our kind of venture were just us building a recording studio <laughs> in San Francisco, and then we had people coming off of uh, Craigslist and having a conversation with a friend or a loved one. And then what we do is create what we call fictitious speakers. These are voices of people that don't exist but that have demographic characteristics that like someone who's building an IVR system. IVR means interactive voice response, it's like a phone tree, basically. There, there are more or less sophisticated ways. I'm happy to kind of go into at least my 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 very little uh, experience like talking with IVR developers, but it's definitely been interesting so far. But, um, you know, the, the the voices that sound a little bit more appropriate for, for the use case, because the Siri voice might sound really good for a news reading application and maybe for the assistant that, that Apple was building, but not probably for the Texas Roadhouse and their, their reservation system. So it's kind of how I how I think about it, both from a kind of usability perspective and also from a um, you know a technological te technology perspective. Just you have to think about it from the data you're collecting. Great. I so think it sounds... I, I, go ahead. Go ahead, Bill. No, you go ahead. Oh, I was just gonna respond to uh, Leigh Lally's. I, I'm sorry if I didn't. Uh, pronounce your name right a question about like well why why isn't there more more diverse pro in products and i think we'll get there um just like we have more genuineness in 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 like for example artists right like <laughs> kendrick lamar's rap name is kendrick lamar and you know what his real name is kendrick lamar right it's like it's about being genuine now like people want to know who you are and i think there's that's coming and and I think Lily was talking about being on brand. People, especially, you know, businesses, they still have a, a fear of being on brand. And so they pick they pick voices that they think are going to appeal to more people. But like Cliff Nass and and, and his students, like uh, may he rest in peace. Like they did a study a long time ago in the early '90s that showed uh, about TTS voices that you can't know in advance who's going to like which voice. It's not that if you're a young person of this descent, you're going to like a female voice of this well, age or whatever. Or if you're German, you're going to like whatever. All of these are preconceived notions that people think they have. And the study clearly showed that if you can't know in advance why I might like Corey's voice over my own voice or whatever, right? That's just me. And I think this- Really? And if, <laughs> yes. And if, if that's true, then um, we, we need to understand that like offering more voices uh, you can go and read the papers if you don't believe me. But if offering more voices is always going to be way more um, interesting than 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 saying, oh, well, we have to do the the Dan Rather voice if you're like a baby boomer or what. That's just not true. Uh, and but it's hard, right? If you're making a decision for uh, as a VP of a large company and you're going to put this voice in all of your BMWs, um, they probably don't want to take a risk. <laughs> and also, when you give multiple voices. Like I've seen this with most of these kind of assistant offerings. It's very, very rare that the people, the users of these systems find out how to change the voice setting. Like how many of you have tried to change the voice on your home speaker? Like probably nobody. And if you do, it's like, how do I do that? Can I get it off? Or even on your Siri phone, right? It's like, it's not very common. 
So I think this on-brand thing is something that's holding the industry back a bit. But like I said, I'm pretty positive on the future. I think the fact that things are changing so quickly as far as what's able to be done is going to is, is going to make a big difference. And I'll, 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 I'll finalize this comment with like if the, when, when the web first came out, remember like the first websites were just so bad, right? They were so bad, but the web made it very, very easy to develop new websites. And the, the cream rose to the top really quickly. Now, if you compare that with voice applications, especially for enterprise or commercial, that has never been the case. It takes an inordinate amount of money and effort to try to, with TTS, ASR, right? In the early days, as you guys know, like we couldn't even distinguish yes from no, right? It was very difficult. So the, the, the rate at which voice user interfaces uh, uh, improved could, could never be a function of all of the great ideas that were coming out there because there was no way to deploy them, right? But if you look at user interface design for the web, I mean, that went like a billion times faster because like if you put some piece of crap on the web, no one was going to use it. But if you put a bad IVR out there, people have to use it, right? Call your bank. It's still going to suck. So I, I think that's, uh, like I said, there's a lot to to um, to the next few years. I think things are going to change drastically and that's a good thing. <laughs> right. um, well, so we've talked about TTS. Uh, what about recognition? I'd like to go there for a moment and we can kind of think about it this way. Uh, one of the things that we were talking about um, in our email exchanges and things like that is this notion of accommodation and being able to accommodate other voices. And what does that mean? And so how would a TTS, uh, like someone has a question about, well, what if I had a TTS that sounded like me? So I'm talking with some system for some purpose and I'm trying to get something done, and it sounds like me. What would that be like? What's good about that? What's bad about that? Is there something in between that would be better? So just that notion of uh, accommodation, which means, uh, well, I'll let you all explain that, but that notion of how, uh, what you might hear might affect how you interact with the system itself. The, the thought that I have, Mary, uh, if you're gonna do accommodation, that's predicated on the ability to recognize, you know, what someone is saying and how they're saying it so that you could, you know, replicate it maybe in the synthesis. Um, but one of the problems with speech recognition is it, it's not very linguistic. I mean, it, first of all, it's, it's predicated on what they call gold standard reference data, which is a kind of mythical notion that there can be one way of transcribing orthographically in spelling any speech. And so much of early speech recognition training data, just like TTS, is read speech. You know, people reading, you know, the, the, the birch planks, the birch canoe slid on the smooth planks, these sentences that were used from like the early days of speech coding. And there's even something called LJ speech where someone, you know, is reading for 24 hours. Um, then there's Libra speech. A lot of speech recognition has been trained on audio books. But the only application I can think of that would really involve being able to recognize read speech would be like proofreading. Whereas any real spontaneous interaction, which I think most of us are interested in, would really be required training on you know, spontaneous speech. But how do you transcribe spontaneous speech? How do you transcribe spontaneous speech from non-standard dialects? You know, a lot of us who are trained as sociolinguists, there were, and we have these sociolinguistic interviews, like Lily mentioned, there are conventions, you know, we're going to do gonna, dunno, whatever this way, and we're going to transcribe numbers that way. But how about, you know, there's so many of those things and filler words and all these kinds of things that really make speech distinctive. But oftentimes, you know, speech recognition transcripts are kind of bleached and wouldn't have that kind of detail. So and the other sad thing is things like pronunciation dictionaries that we use at Nuance have gone by the wayside, at least in speech recognition. Now we use subword units, you know, so uh, it's just little strings of letters. So the, the impact that linguists can have is sometimes reduced uh, by the kind of, like brain dead is a little strong, 
But from a linguistic point of view, I would say it kind of is. Whoa, I lost the audio. Oh, you're muted, Mary. I'm muted. Bill or Lily, did you want to add anything uh, around that topic? Um, yeah, I think, I mean, recognition's a really hard problem. If Even if we had like a tight one-to-one -one correspondence between what someone says and what is, you know, transcribed by the speech recognition system, it doesn't necessarily tell you how they said it. <laughs> um, and, and that can be often a problem, mm -hmm. like, you know, for, I'm trying to imagine if someone wanted to run like analytics, right, for, for a call center, say, and they're transcribing all of the, the speech um, using some, say it's like a really good <laughs> ASR system. And of course, they're, they're, they are really good nowadays, but maybe less so for um, certain kinds of speech. Like I was talking with the manager of um, speech recognition at a large kind of contact center software provider. And apparently, you know, they have customers in the south of the United States and uh, one of the large customers was saying, you know, we pass around the 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 transcriptions that your company gives us, and we like every morning we we pass around them as like the joke of the day, <laughs> and that's just because they're getting callers from Mississippi. Um, and so, uh, but but let's just assume it's perfect, right? It doesn't necessarily going to allow you to do things like sentiment classification because what you're doing is sentiment classification over text very different than I mean I I don't think I even need to give an example, <laughs> although there are probably classical examples. Uh, you know, someone says like, uh, oh, and were you really happy with the service that we provided you today? And and then I say, uh, yeah, I guess, <laughs> you know, I mean, that's 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 one thing. Um, so so I, I think. To that point, I think, you know, these systems really traffic in text and, and text is a pretty lossy format for 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 speech is also like kind of the only thing we have right now, technologically. Technology has come a long way, but it's still, text is kind of the rules of the roost right now. I'll just yeah. be completely um, unlike myself again and say, I don't know, the audio layer of large, of the, of the, of the models that we're seeing is, you know, it's not quite there, but it's coming and it's pretty amazing. So I, I, I really do believe like even things like you know, sentiment analysis for ASR, it's going to, it's not going to be a system whereby you first have to translate speech to text and then do it that way. You just won't, won't have to do that anymore. It's going to be, you know, audio to meaning or intent or discourse function, et cetera. And, uh, and I think a lot of these problems are going to go away. Now, also you have to consider all of these new applications that are kind of, kind of, maybe they're called simple or personal, like talking to a therapist or talking to like a bot therapist or a bot friend or playing a game that's kind of trivial. These are trivial and, and some people might think they're silly, but they're pretty popular, um, especially in other countries and they probably will be here too. Um, but if you compare those kinds of things to say solving the drive-through with automated system right so uh, i've i've had some experience in this and it's 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 funny because even if you solve the understanding issue like let's say you go through some fast food thing in your car like as we do in this country um in a weird amount uh percentage uh but it's not about getting the kind of back and forth and turn taking right which is also very very odd if you've ever had to like sit in a which I have sit in a in a drive through and watch what happens. Um, the, just the semant the, the semantics and the turn taking and the discourse and the whole thing is mind blowing. But even if you got all of that right, like if someone says this, they mean they want this burger and they want this and they want two of those and one of those. It's very very complex. But even let's say you got that all right text wise, the speech thing is a whole different level. Right? <laughs> it's like forget it because now you have to wait for the car to come by and then what if like the the kid in the back like shouts, no, I want cheese on my burger, daddy, right? And like, uh, right, and the, and the dad has said something else in the front. And these are not things you think about um, necessarily, but these are real things that happen in these cars. And uh, now you have to recognize a different voice, but do you, do you believe it? Now, as a human, you totally, you, if you're in the drive-thru and you're working, you totally, you're like, okay, and all you got to do is say like, dad, is that, what, is that what you want to do, right? It's no big deal. But having an AI kind of do that is like, orders of magnitude harder to do 
So wh what I'm trying to say is I still do believe that that will be solved as well. Um, it's a different problem though. It's not a, it's not a, not necessarily just an ASR problem. It's a, it's a whole, like, you know, it's, it's, it's very bespoke to that environment. Um, and, uh, whereas like these other systems where it's like one-to-one, -one, not multi-user, just one-to-one, -one, you know, chat bot kind of thing, maybe it's multimodal too. Maybe you're showing people think, uh, it pictures and it's telling you about it and it's showing you pictures back and stuff like that. That's, uh, that's kind of a different thing. So when I, when I think about all of these problems and all of these topics today, I, I have to keep in mind all of these emerging use cases, which are like, a hundred percent, like like a hundred and eighty degrees different from one another. Like the business person who just wants to fulfill the order, versus the, the you know the the personal interactive interlocutor that's an AI that needs to do everything just right for you to feel warm and fuzzy. Right? It's like mind blowing, but it's all gonna work. I, I promise you, it's all gonna work. <laughs> Well, I want to talk. I want to bring up something that uh, one of the one of the questions in the in the chat that's going on, and that is, how much are you saying, Bill? It's all going to work, but that is really about English and some of the other very uh, rich resource rich languages where there's lots of things for AI to learn from. What about unwritten languages? What about those you know thousands of languages that don't have all those resources. Now I'm going to give you another example, which is my favorite language, American Sign Language, that is other than English, of course, uh, which for which none of the things we've been talking about are going to work. We don't have a giant corpus that's been well marked up and annotated. There is no standard writing system. And the interactions that we do with one another all depend on positional stuff, which is nothing like speech. Like, so there's grammar, grammar is built out of space rather than out of word order. So a uh, language which is heavily case marked or really different from English in structure is not going to just immediately emerge as a, a wonderful AI uh, interface. That's my claim. Well, I'll, I'll let me just I'll let the other people respond to, but I, I'll say that. Uh, I, I, just wanna, I just wanted to say before you yeah. go, go, Bill, uh, I, we were planning to just open this up to audience questions, and this has been perfect. So we're going right. to just answer people's yeah. questions. Yeah, so I'll now. be quick. So my my um, this is part of that. So. Okay. <laughs> uh, so on the on the on the the represented languages, you're right that that we tend to overrepresent certain uh, languages that are spoken more and that have a quote unquote uh, business value, uh, which is you know sad sad but true. Um, so the models that are out there can work for any language. And I believe that there's a lot of, uh, of uh, ground up work to, to, to represent and build large corpora from the, the, the native language of your choice. So the, whether we do it or not um, is, is the problem, but it, it can be done. And the other thing is what's, what's kind of helpful right now is if you, you know, if you just go use BARD or chat GPT right now, and you can kind of speak German or or Swahili to it, and it'll probably work, which is kind of a nice head start. You could never do that with such a random ASR system. So there is that, right? Now, as far as ASR goes, I mean, have you seen the Lex Friedman, uh, Mark Zuckerberg uh, interview recently, where they both they had the meta, um, uh, they had the meta avatars. So it's it's so advanced, it's so advanced that they actually had representations that looked almost identical to Mark Zuckerberg and Lex Friedman in this kind of weird space. Uh, and it was, it was almost perfect. So these are, these are now represent, representations of 3D humans. And from that, you definitely can build huge corpora for ASR. Uh, I'm sure someone's doing it as we speak. Um, I'm not worried uh, because there's, a, there's enough of a large community that cares uh, and the tools are now coming out. I mean, I just see it as this, like, we have we always know what the evils are and what the neglectful uh, large groups of people do to, 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 that, you know, inadvertently or not cause what's happening. But the fact that we can, we can finally do so much more is what's, uh, what's comforting to me. So I would say, um, I don't want to be too positive. I, I'm a grumpy person by nature, but I, I'm blown away at what is I'm seeing like almost every week. Uh, and so I, I, I do think that um, 
now we have the chance. So we'll see if it if it if it's if it's done right or not. But uh, there's so so much more opportunity than there ever used to be in all of these important things that you brought up. I was just going to, uh, regarding foreign languages, or we call it non-English for some reason at work, um, one of the, you may have seen, like, if you look at Microsoft's ASR or TTS offerings, they've got, like, 10 varieties of English, you know, for South Africa, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, Philippines, etc. cetera. Um, so there's kind of like two, that was the way it used to be, but now we can build multilingual models, which not only have, you know, all in one for English, but we can get better results by training English, French, German, and Spanish together. And we can get better results on each individual language, even monolingual stuff uh, than we could with just English data. And the reason seems to be that there's something in common among languages that they can share uh, some of that data. But one of the nice side effects is you can get code switching, you know. So Jared and I, for example, worked, we acquired some Louisiana French, which was a lot of English too. And we just trained, we didn't have to train on Louisiana French. We just trained on English, we trained on French. And now we can recognize English or French words in any combination, you know, to some degree. And, you know, a lot of people scratch their heads, you know, what is Spanglish? What is Franglais? And the linguist would say, well, it's any combination. People have a hard time outside of linguistics for some reason getting that. But the point is that once you uh, imbue a system with multilingual capabilities, it can do a lot of things that it had never seen. You know, it had never seen German mixed with, you know, uh, Telugu or something. But now because it's been trained on both, that becomes a possibility. Lily, did you have anything to add to that question that Nancy was asking about? Definitely echoing what both Bill and Corey have said, which is, for example, at Rhyme, we've only uh, built English TTS. In fact, we've only built US English TTS. So we do have like a lot of varieties of US English, um, but that's just where we started. Um, and definitely not where we're going to end up. And, and the great thing about speech modeling is it's it's very true like if you if you want if we wanted to scale to include spanish german and french we don't need that much data to do this because of how much english data we've collected and it, it's for the exact same reason that the that, that core was mentioning like if you think about the differences across languages from like a signal processing perspective they're like the same thing <laughs> um of course like the relationship between the the text and the speech or just like these latent representations of speech that get that get learned during like a a, a model of speech that isn't mediated by text because they 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 will increasingly exist um, either a speech to speech dialogue system or a speech editing system these kinds of things like uh, spoken language is all very very similar from a signal perspective when it comes to ASL or any sign language very amenable to being to being um, addressed. I think as with any of these things, it's, it really does come down to like, you know, I, I've always thought it was funny though, under under resource language kind of uh, thing. It's like, what what kind of resource are we talking about? At the end of the, end of the day, of course, what people are talking about is not like the resource of having speakers available to give you data or, um, or you know, people writing online for there to be data. It's kind of more along the lines of like, is there business value for making that product? That's just how it, these decisions get made sadly but but very amenable and, and the kind of gesture model people are doing for example like joint joint speech and gesture modeling for generative video it's it's pretty wild um i'm not saying like asl is like actual language gesture isn't <laughs> i don't know what a great metaphor for it is but like these things are very amenable to be modeled um, just a question of will will they be okay i'm gonna very cool some questions. Yeah, Nancy's going to go through and uh, pick out questions. So uh, I've got a couple of questions from Mihai. And Mihai, do you want to ask the most relevant ones out loud? Are you still here? Yes. Either here. one. Probably the most significant one. I didn't see, by the way, in what you guys said, the connection between 
NLP recogn speech recognition and technology. In other words, I didn't see how you are going to combine the two. So that's a different no, question I'm from the ones now. you've already had. Right. In the sense, you talk about linguistic side of recognize, recognizing the speech. I didn't see how what work is done, if any, in making it understandable by computers and us to talk with the computer. So one of my first question was, how does a computer recognize context versus commands? Because if I want to talk with a computer, when I talk with, Alexa, with Google Home, we talk, but there is no particular subject, so to speak. But when I want to have a conversational computer, I want to run applications. I want to sit in, in my on uh, lay in my on my couch and, and talk with the computer and have the dictation, uh, uh, write documents, or do whatever other things. So I have to make the distinction between content, which are words, NLP, so to speak, and commands. So com the computer obeys the commands. Yeah, I, I can I can kind of I think I know what you're talking about, but um so I think you're you're trying to distinguish so I think at the end of the day, and this may not be a satisfying answer for you, but it, it really is all about data. So um if you have a training data set that has that distinction in it, so here's when you make an API call, here's when you dictate, here's when you ask the person back a question because you don't have enough information, et cetera. Um which we've done actually to some extent. Uh, you you get I think what you're what you're asking about, which is I need to be able to talk with this system, and the system needs to be able to distinguish when it's supposed to just say, "Hey, how are you doing?" Versus, you know, I say order me a pizza, or I say take this down, or etc. Right. Um, so it it has to do. I think what you might be talking about at a higher level is is the whole grounding thing. So large language models for a long time, right? People are like, well, they're great and everything, but all they do is, you know, figure out the next thing to say. Um, they're not grounded in reality. They're just only trained on whatever they were trained on six months ago or two years ago. Uh, but these days, right, we've done a lot of work to be able to uh, have the model uh, be able to access external uh, sources, right? So so it's grounded in, in real information. So let's say you're just doing search, right? So if you say, Hey, you know who won the Lakers game last night? You know if you ask, you know if you ask Lambda that uh, whenever Lambda was still the en vogue thing at Google, it wouldn't have known because it doesn't know what happened last night. But now you can actually use function calling, which you know everybody's putting out right with all their models, so that it returns not an answer, a hallucinated answer like "Oh, the Lakers won 18, 118, or whatever." It'll actually say, "Hold on." That means I need to go out to some source and get the answer. Just like it will say, um, even on, on more so simple stuff, like, well, who did uh, so-and-so in Hollywood you know, divorce yesterday? I heard there was something going on. Instead of it, it, the models are trained now to say, wait a minute, that seems like a factual question. So I better do some attributed Q&A kind of answer rather than just blurt something out. So, the, so for example, my team over the last five or six years, we trained a whole bunch of, uh, we, we created a whole bunch of data just like that because we were interested in the model, not just, you know, spurting back, you know, perfect language in a perfectly conversational style. That seemed boring at this point. What we wanted to do is what you're saying is like, well, if I want to order some pizza, then I need it to go and figure out when I say I need a large pepperoni, it needs to say, hey, menu, does this, is there a large pepperoni, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, the way I think we, we solve what you're asking about is that you have these data sets that instead of it just being, you know, loads and loads of conversation where like user says this and then other user says this and then one user says, you actually have the, the actual function call, the actual grounding instructions in the data itself which you then feed back to the model, right? And the model, it's going to do the right thing because it's just another string. It's like, oh, 
guess what? In this context, instead of saying blah and making it up, I have enough data that shows that if a person is saying that, that means they want me to ac access something else, or they, that means they want me to open up docs. And what I'm going to do now is listen for what they want to say so I can type it down. That, that last example might be slightly harder, but I don't know if I'm answering your question, but that's my best answer to what I think you're saying. Yes, you 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 mentioned something about going out for more data, and uh, you 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 kept giving examples with ordering pizza, and my concern is with uh, talking to my word processor and writing a document rather than ordering pizza, because ordering pizza there are many ways to do it, but. Uh, talking to a word processor to, to write a, a document, there are not many. Right. But I think it's still the same thing. Like, how would you do it if okay. I started saying, hey, hey, we're going to write some stuff? Uh, you you would probably say, okay, Bill, I'm ready. Right? <laughs> and then I would say, okay, ready? Well, and you say, yeah. And then I'd say, okay, write this. And then you would do it. And the model is exactly the same. It's going to go now, go to this mode. There's a bunch of hidden there's a bunch of hidden construction instructions that you're following in your head. That's exactly what the data sets that we train the models on have. So uh, we we should have a beer and we'll we'll go deep. <laughs> I like it. We're going to have a beer is more probably next month. So at, Thank you. at the at the event. Well, Jeff Johnson's been adding a lot of cogent comments and provocative uh, statements in the chat. And let me see the most, Jeff, you want to come on and ask one of them or comment on one of them and be provocative here? Well, I'll just be quick. Uh, the last one I put up is, uh, you know, Ben Schneiderman uh, has been arguing for a long time that we shouldn't be designing computers to be assistants we should be designing them to be tools and that AI is best when it's built into things that we're doing um, that are, it's kind of invisible behind the scenes. So, so for example, you know, your camera can recognize faces because of AI, your, your um, um, automatic uh, captioning works well because of AI. Um, so, but the speech model seems to sort of push us maybe unconsciously in the direction of building assistance, speech IO. And so, um, the question is how can we guide this, the development so that we're being, that we apply it in ways that make it more like it's behind the scenes in the tools that we build rather than um sort of in the forefront as you know a butler for you or a um uh, a personal assistant i think it's a good question <laughs> i think it's a really hard question honestly i think that's a really hard question um and I think I agree with you. Um, or I, Ben, I think it's Ben Shinerman. He said, I'll have to look that up. Um, yeah, I, I was recently reading this this article. It's like a Substack article. I just had to quickly Google it to find the author. I'm happy to put it in chat after I'm done talking, but it's called Why Voice Failed as a Platform. And I think it's because people really confuse. It's by Dustin Coates. I'll put it in chat. Um, people really can, and the, the thrust behind that this, this pretty short but pithy piece was like, people confuse like, an input mechanism for interacting with a computer with a platform for 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 discoverability and i think people in voice discoverability is really hard like when you go to a website i mean of course design has taken us really far from the original websites but it, even the early websites you could kind of tell what it was about voice is a lot harder um to this this discovery problem i think there's other problems like that the author would argue like what held back the assistant devices from google amazon and Apple was also things like natural language understanding problems. This probably goes back to the previous question is like people in working, I don't know if this is common knowledge for a lot of people here, but people work with the intent model for understanding language. So if you call a banking system, phone system, uh, 
and this is oftentimes the only time you can actually interact with the the, the organization is on these systems um, is they'll try to understand what you're saying. And, and the way that they do that is by determining whether it's one of four things. <laughs> it, it might be check your balance, report your missing card, right? And I think like um, when it comes to assistant devices, like the modeling on the, the natural language understanding side of things was just simply not good enough such that like at Amazon say there was probably... I don't know how many people were working on Alexa before the layoffs, but quite a number of them were just working on the alarms. Another group of them were working on local search, like asking for directions, these kinds of things. And, and at these organizations, these are like domains of, of application use. Um, and so I think that model is probably not long for this world for building voice applications. We'll see if it, if it helps like voice as a platform, as, as a user interface. But I, I, I think my... My answer is not an answer. I think it's just a form of agreement with you that, and 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 Ben Schneiderman that it that it's a hard hard to build for. Corey, I would. Oh, <laughs> I was just gonna say, uh, I've heard that like parents sometimes have issues with voice assistance because kids don't necessarily have to say please and thank you. And so I don't know if there's some kind of sexism or, you know, we want to be giving orders to the opposite sex or, I, or things like that. So I'm not exactly sure what it would mean to be a tool rather than an assistant, you know, and I don't, I think there's definitely issues like in languages like French or Spanish, which have different pronouns for who you're addressing, uh, that maybe there's a hierarchy between the user and the uh, assistant, you know, sounds like they would be uh, lower on that hierarchy, uh, whether that's desirable. Whereas some of the things we're talking about, like accommodation with Mary earlier, it kind of implies kind of an equal footing. Um, I, I don't, I'm not a UI designer, so I don't really know uh, what you guys would be looking for as far as the relationship that a user should have with one of these systems. I just want to say one thing about uh, the, the uh, voice IO bit. It, it's kind of also now, a, a, you know, if you think about a good assistant, most of it's done asynchronously. It's all behind the scenes, right? You shouldn't have to say, you shouldn't have to sit there for an hour and chit chat with an assistant for it to do stuff, uh, right? We never, we, we don't do that ourselves, even if, you know, Let's say that I had a young child still and I would tell it to do stuff because I was a mean dad, but I don't know how to, <laughs> to tell you this, but right. You, you, you kind of say like, Hey, um, if you did have someone that helped you, you might say, Hey, you know, tonight's that special night that I told you about and I need to do X, Y, and Z. Can you just help me out there? And if the assistant knows you well enough, there's going to be a whole bunch of behind the scenes round trip work that that assistant can and will do in the future. That has nothing to do with like, chit chat the only thing that would come back to you is maybe like maybe there'll be like a text where you say is this what you want or something like there's no there's no speech io required except for maybe the initial thing so i believe that uh people do have this like they can't resist this kind of cool amazing you know science fiction movie for the last 70 years it's got to be speech oh and hal open the 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 pod doors and terminator we're like we just can't get over it but I think as the tools that are being built, the ones that I'm seeing being built anyway, uh, get more sophisticated, I think people will finally get over the speech part in, in the appropriate uh, amount, right? We're going to need it to some extent for some of these apps I've talked about before. But for a lot of it, like no one wants to chit chat with uh, you know, a live bot to to do something that the bot could just take a few things down and go do for you, right? So that there's a lot of people working on on that you know like asynchronous kind of um uh, uh non speech non not so, not so much language in the interaction uh cuz most of this stuff can be done in the, in the background especially when things become more personalized so i think it's a uh, uh, i think it's also something that will be limited but at, by the same token because we can create these uh, like irresistible characters now in 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 such um, uh, fidelity. I think for those of us who've had it up to here with all of that, <laughs> we're going to have to just embrace it because it's coming 
uh, it's coming in droves. Uh, I never thought that people would want to speak with a bot, for example. And I was totally wrong. Uh, just totally wrong about that. Like people do, um, even if they know it's a bot, right? So that's kind of weird, but it, uh, it's true. And it's perhaps I'm the weird one because I don't understand or I, I, I don't understand why people do it, but they do it. And it's just a, a fact of life, I think. Okay. I mean, I, th I see it too. And Corey, I think you're right. It's not, it's, it's sort of the um, forthcoming issue of there's too many uh, older adults who are too lonesome and living at home and uh, the, the aging in place is all very well, but if you don't have anybody visiting you, you might as well have a bot to talk to. Right. And there's a lot of robotics in elder care in places like Japan, where there's an overwhelming number of older people. So I can imagine the non, um, how we say, the more conversation focused rather than task focused kinds of voice interfaces where that that's just a character you live with, you know? Okay, I'm trying to see, are there other questions that we haven't even approached much? Um, and Nancy, you said that we could stay on if people wanted to, although we know Corey, you're on the East Coast. <laughs> but um, going to turn into a pumpkin, I, oh my God. <laughs> if, if the speakers can stay, I can also stay for, for a little longer. Uh, okay, I don't mean to, yes, I, we should acknowledge that in four minutes, we're going to be all turning into pumpkins, although the meeting can continue for as long as we agree that it could continue. At some point I'll call it, you know. <laughs> but if you have to leave before that, anybody who uh, is in the room and not featured on the screen, we're very happy you showed up and that we will, um, we look forward to seeing you next month when we expect to have a hybrid meeting in person in San Francisco and then broadcast webcast as we usually do. And, uh, I'll just throw in the last reminder that we are definitely seeking another uh, program co-chair. And so look at the November 30th Bake High calendar item to get more details about that and to get access to the form to fill out and tell your friends. You may not be the one who wants to be the programmer for Bake High, but you probably have a friend who would be super at it. So keep us in mind as you're thinking and wondering about in the next week or two. Uh, yes, would Bard know what turning into pumpkins means? Exactly my thought. Thank you, Jeff. You should try it. I'll bet it does. I'm sure. <laughs> I'll bet it can give you the history of why people say it. Well, we'll find out. Yeah, I don't know. Um, great. Other live questions or somebody who feels like their question got ignored or shortchanged. We'll take those. I was hoping, um, so I, I see Anne. Anne had, has some interesting, Anne Time Gobble has some interesting questions about uh, uh, mom and, and just people using uh, devices. Anne, did you want to just ask? You're, um, um, you're sort of cutting up there, Mayor. Oh. No, I don't know. I was what I really wanted to share. Actually, I was trying to type or uh, drop something into the chat, but it was too long because I have this interaction when I from just recently. And I can cut it up into pieces, but I was um, typing in Swedish into one of the chatbots, and I'll be nice and not say which one it is. But um, and it basically ga was gaslighting me. <laughs> I said in Swedish, "Can you speak Swedish?" And it says in beautifully perfect Swedish. No, I'm sorry, I can't do that. <laughs> and he kept going back and forth and said, but you just, and I kept talking to it in Swedish or typing. I said, but you just did this in Swedish. Said, oh, no, no. So I, I actually responded in English. I'll, I'll put part of this in here or, you, or I can email it to whoever, but it's hysterical. <laughs> Which is, you know, obviously what's going on is a, an interesting kind of split between the different pieces of the system, right? <laughs> it's like the, the understanding and the... Uh, and just the the processing of it is like that they're not synced up, which is really funny. Um, but uh, I don't know what did I tell you before, Mary. What was I going to talk about? 
sorry. Um, I something about aging. I did, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because you're saying, you know, that we're talking about, you know, it's good for every everybody and everything, and and I was just thinking, you know, as I said, I had this comment about my mom, um, using her speech stuff, and she's kind of she's very tech savvy, you know, ninety year old Swede sitting there talking to her Google device, but um, she um. It makes me think too about the aging aspect, right? I'm really interested in finding out more about, or, or just like thinking about things to, that we can do to, you know, really assist the older users, right? The way that they want to be assisted and not based on whatever ideas that people have before they're in the boat themselves. And as we're all getting closer and closer to being in the boat ourselves. <laughs> but I think there's a huge, Huge um, opportunity there to to really do something, you know. Here, I'll even, I'll even turn on my camera since I'm standing here waving my arms. Are. Yeah. <laughs> so, but, <laughs> but um, yeah. So that that was mainly the thing I was telling saying to Mary earlier that I'm curious to hear what people, either what we know about that's going on that's really useful for the older users and what real in-depth studies are being done to really dig into it because as another point there i was at ces last year and i walked through the arp huge display area and everybody who's working it is basically you know half my age right <laughs> i'm thinking what the hell <laughs> this isn't right we should have people like us who are techie and are approaching the or maybe even are in the arp ourselves right to actually come in there and dig in and be part of it and, and all that. So, there you go. Any thoughts? It seems like to me, oh, sorry. Um, seems like to me like that uh, when it comes to AI interactions that are not intent focused, whether it's an assistant mm -hmm. device or a banking uh, phone tree system, like, very similar to social media, it seems like children are the, the the first adopters of these things. I don't know how many people know about character AI, but there's probably three or four other um, very large organizations. Um, character AI is kind of like this, uh, you can talk to different kinds of, uh, I mean, they're just like fine-tuned language models to have, and I don't know how fine-tuned actually, it could be very little actually, like to be like, I'm talking to Super Mario right now. I'm talking to X, Y, or Z anime character or character from Harry Potter. And and actually, like, I'm sure they'll have a voice layer on top of these applications, but it's it's actually wild how much engagement these applications have. I think, like, even for me, I'm 31. I had, it's hard for me to comprehend how how like there are, there are children who are interacting with these 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 large language model for, as entertainment devices. Right like many hours a day, like they're, they're measuring engagement in like five plus hours a day, similar to like probably what Facebook was like in 2004. <laughs> and so probably, probably I would say like always hard to draw analogies, but the analogies seem very clear that this, this is like, um, you know, I'm probably not going to be chatting with a, a Super Mario anytime soon. And, and probably neither is your grandma, your, your mother, but, uh, yeah. but like there's, there's yeah. something coming, right? Right. Because, I mean, as a modality, speech is obviously very handy for certain things, right? For example. And um, um, as actually, you know, what, what Jeff was saying about Schneiderman, uh, Schneiderman, I actually, I'm glad to hear actually that about this thing about kids just using devices more like tools instead of assistance. They shouldn't say thank you. They're devices. That's kind of my, <laughs> I'm, very, I'm sort of a pro Ben Schneiderman kind of person, you know, so... Um, I find that interesting. Really great discussion, you guys. I was. I just wanted to bring up a thought that I had about this. Is that um, it's interesting if you if you go out and observe people of all ages using technology, they they actually do very little. Like just people generally, not people in the tech industry per se. They they don't do it in isolation. They use technologies around other people and they tend to get a lot of help. And um, so that's just to me an interesting part of this is 
if someone is in isolation and we're asking them to use technologies, if there aren't other people around as there are for other people in other places, in other words, it could be the answer is people. The answer isn't in the technology. It's and it's just a, another thought in that area. So, Mary, uh, Mary, I think that I'm going to turn into a pumpkin now. Yeah. But that doesn't mean that you all don't need to continue. But I will um, see you next time. And I just want to thank you for having me. Well, thank you. Yeah, I'll, I'll okay. take off, too. Thanks very much. I really enjoyed this. Thank okay. you, Corey. Thank Bye. you, Bill. Thank you, Lily. Thank, thank you, thank you Nancy. <laughs> thank you, everyone. And thank you all so, for sticking around to the bitter end of past Bill's bedtime. <laughs> and we hope to see you all next month at Bake High, whether you're going to be physically present with us or virtual like this on the Zoom call. Okay. We'll call it a night. Thank you. Thanks, Mary. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody.